In this episode, we talk about pangolins, the most trafficked mammal in the world. I chat with Eliza Panjang, a leading pangolin expert in Southeast Asia, who has helped elevate the protection status of pangolins in Malaysia. We talk about socioeconomics, law and corruption, science and education, and conservation. It was a very insightful chat, and I hope you'll enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Welcome to the EcoChat Podcast. If you're into animals, nature, the environment, then this is the podcast for you. In each episode, I chat with the world's leading experts to discuss issues our planet is facing and learn how you and I can make a difference. So without further ado, let's jump right in. Eliza, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. And yeah, I'm super excited to jump in and chat about pangolins. So just to start off, for listeners who might not know what a pangolin is, could you please describe what is a pangolin and what makes them unique? All right. Thank you, Sam. So what is a pangolin? A pangolin is a unique species of wildlife. It is a mammal of medium size. It is elusive, rare, and endangered throughout its range states. The pangolin's most uh, distinguishing characteristics are that it rolls its body into a tight ball and that it has overlapping hard keratin scales covering almost all of its body. As a result, a pangolin is also called as a scaly anteater. Uh, don't be surprised, uh, many children and adults are unaware that pangolins exist in our world. So Sam, thank you for inviting me to speak about pangolins so that more people are aware of this amazing species. That's great. And just to give listeners a bit more visual context on what a pangolin looks like, I think the term scaly anteater describes it very well. Yes. Or you can think of it as like an armadillo, but with larger scales. Mm -hmm. So Eliza, I know you mentioned that a lot of people might not know about pangolins. So where exactly are they found in the world? Yeah, there are eight pangolin species in the world and they can be found in tropical Africa, uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia. So based on the IUCN red list, um, so I'm, I'm talking now about the status. So the two species are vulnerable. Uh, three are endangered and three are critically endangered. So for your information, um, what is IUCN red list is a comprehensive list of biological species. Uh, that have been assessed for their risk of extinction. Yeah. And what's the behavior or habits of pangolins? Like, what do they eat? Where do they live? And do they come out at night, I assume? Yes, pangolins are actually nocturnal species. So mostly they are active at night. And then um, they mostly eat ants and termites. Um. I think that's that's that, that's about it, yeah. <laughs> Got it. And unfortunately, pangolins are termed the most trafficked mammal in the world. So why are they the most trafficked mammal in the world? Like, why are people hunting them? Why is there such a high demand? Yes, um, pangolins are actually threatened by poaching for the illicit wallet trade. Um, largely due to high demand for traditional Chinese and Vietnamese medicines. Um, in some countries, uh, despite being protected by national state laws, um, local people continue to hunt and, yeah, consume pangolins due to a lack of enfor enforcement as well as poverty. Um, pangolins are also threatened by habitat loss. And more and more pangolins are forced to leave their natural habitats and are found near human settlements where they are sometimes rescued by uh, the public, um, attacked by feral dogs and involved in road accidents. And so what part of the pangolin is actually consumed for traditional medicine? Like, is it the meat or the scales? Yes, it was actually the scales. 
which is uh, made of material called keratin, which is also found in human fingernails, human hairs. So I don't, yeah, this, this belief is really need to be stopped. So are there any medicinal or health benefits to eating pangolin scales or is it basically just like eating a human fingernail? They're just actually eating human fingernails because study have been conducted by scientists and there is nothing. Um, scientists didn't found any medicinal benefits in pangolin scales. Hmm, okay. So for people who do buy these scales, what do they believe? Like, do they think it cures cancer or something? The belief, non-medicinal belief, yes. They believe that um, the scales, if you make it in a powder, yeah, they, they can cure some dangerous diseases. But actually, it's already proven. There's no medicinal benefits. But then it's the, the job, you know, of a scientist Instead of just publishing, they need to go out and speak with the public that this is what the the the, the research said. So you need you need to um, stop doing doing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's often a discrepancy between what people believe and what's actually scientifically proven. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So being the most trafficked mammal in the world, how bad? Is it like how much is actually being trafficked every year? Do you have any statistics to share with us to give us a sense of how big this problem is? Um, if you if you read in in uh, um, if you Google or read in, in in newspapers, it was believed there has been like um, one million in the last um, ten years have been um, slaughtered. So this is a huge number. This is really a huge number, and if this rate continue, um, definitely we will lose our pangolins. So this that, this is a big number. So, what is currently being done for pangolin conservation? Like, what are nonprofits or governments actually doing to try and stop this issue? Oh yes, um, I think what most act at the moment, what most important is, for example, uh, I'm talking about Southeast Asia. Um, it depends on the type of group. Number one is to tackle the, the 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 hunters, which is majority are rural communities who are unaware of the pangolin situation and conservation issues. So this is the the first group that need to be um, for focus on. And then we have these poachers who, who is bringing, you know, who is bringing guns, who works in groups, who works in syndicate and to um, smuggle pangolin, trading pangolins from one country to another country. So this is the second group that need to be, uh, to be tackled. And of course, there has been governments and NGOs collaborating, um, mostly to, um, to conduct outreach, you no know, education and uh, public awareness. So I think these are the three important aspects that, um, especially in Southeast Asia, that has been focused on. So let's focus on the first two groups that you mentioned. So the first group is people in rural communities who hunt pangolins, but they might not be aware of the conservation implications of this. Mm -hmm. And then the second group is these syndicates who are highly organized and they conduct smuggling and poaching operations at a large scale. So are there any solutions to this right now or do you have any ideas on how we can address these two groups yeah. First of all, let me talk a little bit about why do people still hunt them? Uh, yeah, despite the um, protections uh, given to pangolins. So, local villagers uh, who live near the forest boundary, they enter the forest to hunt pangolins and other wildlife to feed their families. Wildlife meat will also be sold uh, in small towns to generate money for the family. So this is how rural communities survive, through hunting and farming. The majority of rural communities are unaware of wildlife 
protection and conservation and as well the enforcement also faces difficulties in monitoring the forests. We are talking about the big areas of forest, right? Huge areas of forest. And um, enforcing, you know, monitoring bushmeat sellers were also um, one of the challenges. People, uh, you know, in the cities, um, they have access to the latest information and are aware of the pangolin issues in the countries, but not for the rural communities because, like, in my country, it is very hard to get um, info, you know, information, even internet connections or or mobile connections. Uh, it's not available in rural community in in rural areas. So this is you no know, the 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 information is not reaching them. And how do they um, e- um, be educated? And we are talk- also talking about livelihood. This is something that they have been done generation by generation. So that is the the problem. Hunting and farming are the uh, their livelihood. So this is the you know the, the the group. And how do we make sure that the hunters are make away of you know these um, implications? So I think the government uh, must look for alternatives to support the hunters' livelihood while also educating the villagers. So we know that the families survive by hunting and farming. So, yeah, we know that they must eat and the children must go to school. I think it's important to improve uh, village infrastructure, you know, such as access to small town markets from villages uh, to buy meat or groceries so they don't go, you know, in the forest and hunt. And opportunities for education, as uh, particularly for poor families, so that they don't um, just be in that cycle. If, if for example... The, the 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 family is coming from a hunter's family they don't just be in that cycle they when they have education they 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 the family change you know the the mindset change so i think that is um very important for for the rural communities okay what about the second group that you mentioned the syndicates who yes. are highly organized groups of people who you know intentionally hunt, smuggle, and trade pangolins at a large scale for profit. How do we target this group of people? Yes, and then we are. there is also this group who are poachers. So there's hunters and poachers. These poachers are really evil, you know, evil. They walk in groups. They, they have access to guns, and they are also connected or taken care by important peoples. They go in the forest. Um, but uh, using big cars, and then they have access to to the uh, forest reserves. So why we know about this is because some researchers um set up you know camera traps in the forest, and then their activities were accidentally captured on camera traps. And when 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 researchers you know um present these evidences. The uh, unfortunately, the poachers were not convicted. You know, so we know that these people, these poachers, they are taken care. They are supported by important individual organizations. So unfortunately, this is very true in 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 some countries, including um, my countries. Okay, and so just to give listeners more context, a camera trap uh, is yes. a motion censored. You can think of it as a surveillance camera that scientists put across the rainforest to study the movement patterns of animals. But Eliza, what you're saying is that some of these traps have accidentally captured images of poachers hunting penguins, but when these photos are taken to court as evidence against these syndicates, the photos were simply dismissed and are you suggesting that this could be because these syndicates might have connections with authorities and that's why they were let off easily? Is that correct? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Unfortunately, this, this is happening in, in my country and also I understand in some other countries, yeah. Yeah, I assume because it's such a lucrative business? Oh, it is, definitely, yeah. So are there any solutions to this? Because it seems like a very complicated issue involving politicians or even like legislative authorities. And so 
you know, what can we do to stop these syndicates and effectively convict people who are involved? Yeah, um, talking about corruption is another big issue, but it's unfortunately it it you know it connect all of the um, you know corruption. It makes it easy for other crimes to to thrive. So it's an it's, it's important issue to tackle. But um, what I um, what is important in conservation is that um, the authorities, the courts, they need to make sure that the poachers uh, must be apprehended and punished to the maximum extent of the law. I think this is the only way to stop or discourage poachers from hunting. We need to make a case, yeah, you make a case and uh, make sure people are know about this so people you know psychologically people will be afraid to um to 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 hunt or poach for an animal so i think it's very important um for authorities and the court to to set an example okay so i have an idea i want to run by you and you can see if it's feasible because you know how the hunting of pangolins or other high value wildlife parts like ivory it's so lucrative and the reward to risk ratio is so high mm-hmm. like there's a huge potential for profit but the risk is so low right and the cost of getting caught is also so low why can't we increase the penalties to make it so formidable that it deters people from even thinking about poaching pangolins why can't we increase the penalties like why hasn't this been done or what needs to be done to increase the penalties um i can only talk about uh what happened in my country um mm-hmm. because i'm familiar with yeah with my with my country the the sunda pangolin uh in in my country recently was upgraded you know, to totally protected. Previously was listed as a protected species, meaning the species can still be hunted um, using hunting permit. But now that the pangolins is listed in a as a totally protected species, so any hunting or possessing of pangolin, eating, um, owning a pangolin is forbidden. You know, it's 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 is banned. So, and then the, the penalty was also increased. Stricter, and for example, the mandatory gel, so meaning there's always a, a gel, like um, one to five years, as well as fine, and then fine also uh, increase. I think the, the policy is there, the, the, the law is there, the the problem is now is to make sure how to strengthen you know strengthen the enforcement you know even if um the smugglers or the traders or the the hunters the poachers they are they don't want to be put in jail for maybe for one year or two years because because they lose their freedom right i think it's it's important to to make sure that they are put in jail, you know, and then fine. So I think this will make them um, discouraged. So for me, it's important, uh, you know, the law enforcement to be strengthened. They they need to enforce, you know, enforce the law and just go down, you know, um, be be in the field and then um, do do whatever you need to do. Right now, we have all these workshops, you know, workshops to improve. Uh, policy to to develop as you know SOP protocol guidelines, but it's too academic. Yes, they they published it in a in a paper or, or in a news article or yeah like like a, like people can read, but it's not been enforced. It's just uh, this paper just sitting in the table and it was not enforced. So I think that's the problem um, in the world nowadays. We just need to. To have a really strong team, you know, a dedicated and just enforce everything. I think that, that that is my 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 opinion. Yeah. So one quick question that popped up in my head. I don't know if you would have the answer to it, but do you know what 
is the average value of a pangolin. Like how much can a poacher make on average from trading one pangolin? Yeah, about trade. I don't read, uh, we don't really have, um, the numbers or the, the price for that. For example, uh, we are still trying to develop how to, yeah, develop this, the number, you know, the, how mm-hmm. the price, the number. I think most researchers are still, um, finding out about this. Yeah. Because like you mentioned, like if the jail term is only three to five years, but the value of trading a pangolin can feed their families for like five to 10 years, then it's still very worthwhile to, you know, continue hunting penguins, right? So it's really about balancing the reward to risk ratio and actually make the risk high enough to deter poaching. Mm -hmm. Another thought I had was, so you mentioned the priority right now is to increase penalties Mm -hmm. and strengthen enforcement. So what can we as normal people without much power to, you know, change policy ourselves, what can we do to influence legislative change or put pressure on decision makers to increase penalties, to put more resources into enforcement? Um, individually, I think we should make more noise. Yeah. Oh, uh, I think that's, that's what has been done uh, for the, you know, the NGOs, the conservationists. They have been, yeah, they, they are the, the, in, in the front line making noise and try to, like, uh, push the government to, to improve policy for the pangolin conservation. For ordinary people, what you can do and to support this, um, either, attend either supporting your local NGOs um like to to make more noise you can spread the, the the awareness but for me every people you know everyone what they can do is don't eat pangolins you know don't buy pangolin products um and also keep an eye out for suspicious activity uh, notify the wildlife department if you witness one i think that is in individual can do um, and then of course, yeah, support the, the NGOs and the, by making more noise. Okay. So on that note, I kind of have a two part question. The first part is for listeners who are located in places where pangolins are not hunted or consumed. So maybe like the USA or Europe, but you know, they're extremely passionate about pangolin conservation. They want to do something to contribute. What can these people do to contribute to the cause? And then the second question is for those listeners who are located in places where pangolins are hunted or consumed, what can they do to contribute to pangolin conservation? Yes, for the people who live um, with pangolins you know, in, in the country, that they, they have pangolins in the country and they are um, involved with the pangolin issues being being illegally traded, being hunted. What you can do is just, just say no to, to buying pangolin products. Like I mentioned earlier, um, if people, if you see pangolin products being displayed in the, in the shop or being, uh, sold in, in bush, bush meat markets, um, just say to yourself, I don't eat pangolins. I don't buy pangolin products. And if, you are happen to witness all of these um, activities, this these illegal activities. Make sure you have the authorities, you know, the wildlife hotline numbers in your phone, and actively, you know, um, immediately notify the wildlife department. So that is very important. As uh, that is what you can do as an individual. And then for people who's not living in in places where yeah they don't have pangolin. <laughs> So what they can do is you can learn about pangolins and spread the word. You know, attend workshops or attend um, webinars, attend awareness programs. Or if you cannot do this, just find information, you know, learn about pangolins on um, either offline or online and learn about them and don't forget to spread uh, the word. So support also pangolin conservation if you can. For example, um, volunteerism or donation. 
So that is what we we can do as a as a person. Okay. And I just wanted to go back to one of your previous comments where you said NGOs are trying to quote unquote make noise. So I just wanted to clarify what exactly do you mean by make noise? Is that like protesting or sharing on social media? Like what are the ways to make noise and what way do you think is the most effective to really get this message heard, especially by decision makers, by people with legislative authority? Yeah, if we are talking about individuals, like um, like 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 for for me, what I can do to make a noise. So what I can what I can suggest, uh, what what I mean is, for example, NGOs are trying to organize something like a like an event like an event to ask for you know public's opinion you know uh, how we can do that like you know like a survey you 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 can attend that and contribute to that but if it's something that offline uh, online for example you can share information like you 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 spread the awareness so i think this is what i mean as an individual you can make noise by supporting um to spread awareness got it so, Eliza, I know you are one of the leading pangolin experts in Southeast Asia, and you've done so much to contribute to pangolin conservation. I just wanted to learn more about your research, like what were the objectives, your findings, and how did that contribute to pangolin conservation? Yeah, so my research project is titled Landscape Ecology and Behavioral Responses of the Sunda Pangolin to habitat fragmentation and degradation in Sabah, Malaysia. So I am interested about how the Sunda pangolin and endangered species survives in a human dominated landscape, as well as the effects of habitat fragmentation and degradation on the Sunda pangolin populations. So my study area is within the wildlife sanctuary but the sanctuary has been, you know, severely fragmented and degraded as a result of human activities, such as village settlements, infrastructure development, and oil palm plantations. So in my research, I employed a variety of methods. Um, this include non-invasive infrared camera traps, um, radio and GPS telemetry, and of course, social science. So in which I interviewed um, uh, local communities, uh, oil palm plantation workers. Yeah, so these, these are my respondents. And then in my research, I also uh, collaborated with local villagers and oil palm workers who live near the sanctuary. So encouraging them to take part in pangolin research and conservation. Um, some of the key findings from my research I believe everyone involved in my research learned a lot about pangolins. We were excited uh, to learn that pangolins, yeah, can swim across the rivers. These are small things, but for us, it was really big. Yeah, if pangolin climbing tall trees, um, pangolins, you know, um, sleeping in specific shelters, Shelters means the way the pangolin sleeps, so this it's also called a sleeping site. So this is a small things, but no, but for us it's a it's was really exciting moment for us. It's 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 a very uh, important information. We were also uh, excited to see few wild pangolins in the forest and learn about the wild behavior of this uh, elusive species. I was able to establish um, pangolin home ranges, explain how pangolins use their habitats, and then describe their microhabitats in detail. Um, aside from that, uh, my research work allows me to raise awareness uh, among local villages and oil palm plantations about the um, importance of protecting and conserving pangolins in the area. Um, my research findings has um, impact, yeah, impact um, pangolin uh, conservation management uh, in, in, in Sabah. So a quick question about your research findings. Um, I know you found some more information on pangolin behavior, ecology, their habitats, etc. Mm -hmm. 
Are you afraid that once you publish this information, that poachers would actually use and exploit this information to their advantage and hunt down more penguins? Oh, yes, definitely. When we try to... Um, this is actually one of the important um, discussion, you know, important information that we need to discuss when we want to publish, you know, write a paper and publish uh, the paper. So we, for us, we really need to discuss with the relevant stakeholders and how do we want to um, carefully sharing this information. Because we we need to share this information because it's very important to improve pangolin conservation, but we need to find um, a way to protect the, the the pangolins, but as well at the same time um, to 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 share the information to the uh, science communities and 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 of course the the the, the public. So I'm still at the moment is is um, is in discussion and. Definitely, we will find a way um, to to overcome the the problem. So, you mentioned that your research has influenced policy change. So, I was just wondering if you could provide more details on how exactly your research findings translated into policy change. Because I know a lot of scientists and conservationists, the stuff they do is very academic. And very rarely does it actually translate into any policy change or any actionable change in real life. So I was just wondering, what are the steps you took to get your research findings out to the decision makers and actually influence change? Yeah, um, in 2015, I participated in the first ever pangolin conservation workshop in Sabah. Yeah, in my country. And I was one of the people in charge of drafting the proposal to the government to upgrade the pangolin protection status in Sabah. So my team and I work hard to achieve this and the work was difficult. Yeah, we are using uh, the data that is coming from, from my research. And then um, it was quite, um, quite difficult. But because we don't really have many, as many data as possible, but we, we, we tried, you know, to use that data and influence, um, you know, tr- try to propose uh, a way to improve pangolin conservations. And then, um, I think in 2018, you know, for four years later, the pangolin, Sunda pangolin was uh, upgraded to the highest level of protection in Sabah from protected to totally protected. Um, so in comparison to the previous status, this means harsher punishment, a mandatory jail time and higher fine. So I'm um, for, so yeah, well done to Sabah for that. Um, I think that is really as a, as a researcher, um, my, myself that really opened my, my eyes, you know, um, scientists, they, they can also involve in, not only doing research, but they 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 use their knowledge and experience to to be involved, you know, with conservationists to improve the policy, yeah, to to for for wildlife conservation. Well, that's just incredible, Eliza. How you were able to influence the upgrade of protection for the Sunda pangolin and increase the penalties of smuggling these pangolins. That's a very commendable feat that you have achieved. So thank you so much for doing that. And on that note, what advice would you give scientists who don't really have a network but would like to reach out to these decision makers or policy makers and really have their work influence change and make a difference? Yeah, so I'm I'm talking um, in my own experience. Well, throughout my research, I met and worked with people and communities who were directly and indirectly affected by or involved with pangolin conservation issues. Um, for me, I would like these people to get involved in pangolin research and conservation. So I was already a scientist. And for me, I believe it's easier to engage and educate people because 
I feel that I am, uh, I have the knowledge about pangolins and I'm, I'm familiar with conservation tools and issues. Um, in order to understand about, um, engaging with people, you know, and, um, doing education. Yeah. Because you are transitioned from research and then you want to go to doing conservation, right? So for me, it was important for me to join. You know, join um, several trainings to improve my communications and conservation practices. And also, it's important to network with the right people. Yeah, the right people, so that we are uh, you understand uh, the, the the issues. I think for scientists, um, especially local scientists who works in their own country, you are actually someone who will make a difference because it's your country so you need to step up and uh, and and do something for the species yeah the species in your uh, uh, for wildlife conservation in your in your country so i think it's networking is important find the right group of people and then um yeah d- um don't be afraid to 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 attend you know trainings um how to do if i want to um, talk with people. W- 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 what do I do? Like, for example, myself, I went for, tra- I went to attend trainings, um, how to resolve, um, conflict, you know, co- conflict resolutions. And I also went for trainings to how to, um, how do, what was the, the title of the training? It was conservation planning. So I equipped myself with all this information. So that I have the right tools, um, and, and I understand how to use it. And then just do your best. Yeah. When you all have, you, you have, you have all of this and then just, just, just be involved and do the best you, you can. Yeah. That's great advice. And I would second your advice on, you know, just taking different trainings and workshops, try to learn new skills such as communication, leadership, conflict resolution, project management, etc. These are all super valuable skills that you need to have to become an impactful leader outside of academia, outside of science, and actually make a difference in the real world. And so, for example, I know you, Eliza, outside of your research, you're also very active in education and outreach. So can you talk to us about that? Yeah, um, my position uh, at the moment is the as a pangolin conservation officer uh, with the Danau Girang Field Center. Um, I work with the education team who is head by an education officer. So my role is I am heading any activities pertaining to the pangolin education and public awareness. So I work with my education team and other conservation partners to produce educational materials and uh, distribute them to the public, either offline or online. So I organize um, conservation talks and exhibitions uh, with schools and the public, especially during uh, World Pangolin Day, for example, World Wildlife Day and Species Endangered Day, um, apart from that, I also develop education program and workshop for pangolin um, stakeholders. So this is when I started my uh, my my research. I was at the same time um, hired as a conservation a pangolin conservation officer. So it's I I am working and at the same time doing research. So I think it's it's really um, how do I say it. Um, I learn in, in both ways. Yeah, the research in the education and the, and then the conservation comes later when 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 you know the issues when you want to to, to do more because you have the you you know more understand about the issues, right? So you you want to do to to contribute more. So that is when I uh, uh, become you know um, involved in pangolin conservation. Yeah. Okay. And going back to the first group of people you mentioned who hunt pangolins, these are people in rural communities who rely on hunting and farming as their livelihoods. Do you reach out 
to them and try to educate these people on pangolin conservation? Definitely, yes. During my during my field work, when, whenever I do my field work, I first I need to make sure that I engage with the local communities or the the any stakeholder, like the for example the oil palm plantation workers, because my research, you know, my re, my study area is conducted in this area, so I want them to 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 join, you know, to participate in my pangolin research and conservation. Um, I want to, how do I say this? Um, you know, empower this, this, this people to be involved. I don't want to, for example, there, there is a, a word specific to, <laughs> to a local word. It's called, um, shiok sendiri in, in, in local, <laughs> local language. Shiok sendiri means, um, you just do it, but without thinking of other people. So, so something like this. Yeah. So I want, I want, um, to do work that is also involving the, the people who are affected, uh, either directly or indirectly. Yeah. So definitely, um, people, um, I am engaging and also educating, um, the local, uh, villagers and, uh, especially the oil palm plantation workers. Yeah. So I'm trying to put myself into the shoes of these people in rural communities. I think the main priority for them is to feed their families, right? Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, then in terms of priorities, they might not care as much about pangolin conservation. They might not care about driving a species to extinction compared with, you know, just feeding their families. And so... How do you educate them based on this bias? Like, what's the incentive for them for not hunting pangolins? Yeah, I think for many, for many countries, this is still a very challenging, um, issues to address. If, yeah, like, like you mentioned, if you put our, you know, if we put ourselves in the, in the shoe, like, I just want to feed my family. Uh, I don't care about the others. But when, when, when I educate the way I try to engage them and try to educate them is I tell them it, of course, it is important. Family is the most important, right? Um, and then the, the children, they need to, you know, to go to schools. It's definitely very important. But I make sure to let, uh, tell them what will happen in the long term. Um, what will happen? The consequences if they are, co- if they are arrested by the local authority. For example, who are going to take care of your family? For example, if you are arrested, who is taking care of your family? So, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it's about in- educating them about the law, uh, the consequences of doing so. And of course, I am also not only engaging with the local communities, the rural villages, you know, but also engaging with the the government who like like ask them, you know, um uh, influence them to find um alternative solutions to help them to shift away from that um activities. Yeah. Um I think it's very important. For example, if they, if we don't want them to continue to hunt, what should the government do? Uh, government should collaborate with NGOs and provide alternatives. So I think for my way of engaging with people is, is depend on the groups, um, for the local villagers and also the, the government, but make sure that both of them, um, have the, you know, share the benefits. I think it's very important. There's, there's a, lot, a lot of group that you need to engage, not only one group, but there's a lot of group you need to engage and make sure all this group are working together. I think that is, um, this is very important. Yes, conservation is actually not so much on Wala. It's more like um, working with people, how to make sure people and, you know, the human and wildlife um Living harmony. I think the part to working with human is actually the most challenging one. Yeah. Yeah. I can't agree more with that. 
Eliza, I have another idea to run through you. And this could be a potential way to stop the second group of people, which you mentioned, the syndicates, Mm -hmm. which are very organized and they coordinate, you know, large scale poaching and smuggling activities. So here's the idea. I want to see if, if what your opinions are and if it works. So people use social media or they use their phones. They use the internet. They use some sort of communication platform every day, right? Whether it's Mm -hmm. Telegram or Messenger, WhatsApp, WeChat, etc. And I'm sure like cybersecurity companies have this data. Like they have information about everyone. They probably know what you and I are doing right now, where we're at, what are our interests, what are our intentions, etc. So is there any way that, you know, conservation authorities can collaborate with these cybersecurity, cyber intelligence companies and leverage this data to stop poaching activity from these syndicates? Um, for, in my understanding, we are, I, um, I understand this as, uh, how do we call it? Big data. Yes. Yeah. Big data. So yeah, we have this. I mean, yeah, this is a, 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 a modern era with, you know, with technologies, with, yeah, we're talking about big data. It's that we need people, organization who is really uh, passionate about, um, you, um, you know, using this data to really address the illegal wildlife threat issue. I think it's very important. I know some um, organizations um, working with, you know, researchers who are looking into this, but I have not seen any, um, how do I say it? I think most of them are still in um, pilot study. So at the moment, I have not seen any, what was the word, uh, success stories yeah from from them but yeah this is definitely something that we can um uh, expertise you know who is whoever is expertise in in biosecurity to look into this um really um an opportunity because imagine if we if we know where are these 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 uh, smugglers these traders these poachers it would be really good to you know to have this information and just arrest them. And then we go back to the, the other challenge, you know, when you have this information on who to, you know, who need to be arrested, everything. But then I'm, I'm sure these people are smart because, yeah, because the, the poachers, they're, they're, they're really smart because it's very hard to, to catch them. Um, even, even if we have the information, make sure that the local authority um, be able to apprehend them. Yeah. Because we, we have all of this information, but we then don't have the, you know, uh, not be able to catch it because of, yeah, substance corruption, corruption. So everything, um, I think it's important to address all of the issues. But yeah, like you mentioned, it's good. It, it's a vital step to look into big data and technology to, identify this 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 syndicates yeah because i would think these people have to communicate somehow right whether it's through a communication app like telegram or through their phones so if these app companies or if these phone network companies can provide data to conservation authorities i don't, I don't know if it's like a privacy issue but when needed when necessary provide data to conservation authorities showing that like hey these people are coordinating for this large-scale poaching operation then this can be direct evidence to put them to jail and stop their operations yes i i i really agree with that um illegal wallet threads are currently thriving in the social medias so i think big platform like the facebook twitter or even TikTok, they need to really um, involve, you know, in 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 conservation. Maybe the the local authority or or the conservationists they need to approach um, this 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 organizations, you know, these these platforms to to support them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of room and opportunities to collaborate with 
different technologies, different companies to really effectively resolve this worldwide poaching issue. Mm -hmm. So to conclude, I know we've covered so many different aspects about pangolin conservation. I just wanted to bring all the pieces together and ask you, what three main areas should we focus our funding and resources into for the most impact for pangolin conservation? I think number one is it's very important to really improve strengthening the law enforcement. Yeah, that is very important. And then um, second is to fight um, illegal wildlife trade and illegal poaching. That is very important to combat this problem. This The, the activities will be how to reduce demand so that people don't um, eat pangolins or use uh, pangolin products. Um, behavioral change. We need to um, change people' behavior, you know, mindset. That is very important. And then number three, of course, is the um, um, continue education. You know, education is a long term. Yeah, it's not like a short term. We are, but it's it's education and public awareness is important, especially to educate the the the, the younger generation, the children, so that. You know, do the pangolin have future? So I think that is the three main areas uh, for me is very, very important. Yeah. Completely agree with what you said. And yeah, my humble opinion is very similar to yours. I think, honestly, we don't need to put any more funding and resources into science and research because it's not going to move the needle much. We already know what we need to know and where we need to focus our efforts now is in policy change, enforcement, and education. Yes. So we covered a lot of ground today on pangolin conservation, and it was super insightful chatting with you. So Eliza, thank you so much for your time. And I just wanted to give you a chance to hand off to the audience where they can contact you, learn more about you or about pangolin conservation, or if there's any other resources you would like to share, please point us in the right direction. Yeah, there are some um, organizations um, um, on social media that you can um, read. For example, the IUCN Pangolin Specialist Group, um, the Safe Pangolins. Um, you can also search uh, my name, Elisa Panjang, on any platforms like uh, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram, and um, contact me or read about um, our pangolin conservation activities. Yeah. Great. And I will put all the links in the show notes or the description below. So, Eliza, thank you so much and hope to have you again in the future. All right. Thank you so much, Sam. That's it for today's episode of EcoChat. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date with the latest episodes. If you enjoyed it, consider leaving a rating and review and share it with your network to spread more awareness. And with that, I'll catch you next time on EcoChat. <laughs>